Hi, my name is Dan Zeilinger, and I have been a world-traveling full-time trad jazz musician for the past 40 years. Some of my most memorable performances were on the lawn of Edinburgh Castle at Imperial Palace in Japan, as well as TV shows and commercials across the world. I've met many people during my career and have spent many hours on stage and off with these musicians, talking about jazz, life, and more. Some are touring musicians, some are theme park warriors, and some are casual musicians who play on the weekends with friends. I think they all have stories worthy of a movie script. And through these interviews, I'll be sharing them with you. Hi there, this is Dan Zeilinger with Trad Jazz Today. And my next very special guest is somebody who I actually spent some time in the trenches with, uh, with the 10th Avenue Band. And with that band, it was in the trenches. No. Um, <laughs> Uh, we have shared experiences and, and a lot of history, but he's now moved away and doesn't call anymore. So what can I say? Mr. Matt Mooney. Hello, Matt. Hi, Dan. How are you doing? I'm doing okay, buddy. I really do miss you, though. We had some, you know, I think you were the only person in that band for a while that I bonded with it, as far as the madness that was happening. Well, we were the young guys, right? <laughs> oh, oh, you had to remind me. Oh, yes, we were. Um, although you are about, I think, nine years younger than I. A little bit, yep. yep. Just, a, just somewhere in there. But uh, we have our, our uh, shared experience with Charlie Clark, and that always helped. Oh, yeah. It was a good time. So Matt was the banjo player with 10th Avenue for how long? I joined 10th Avenue in, nine, I started practicing in 1994 with Ed in like December. That's how I met him. And then I started playing with him in basically the beginning of 1995. Yeah. Well, let's, think, go. I'm, let's go. I'll get there, but let's go all the way back. If you've seen my interviews, you know why I like to start with where people sure, are absolutely. And yeah. you're, an, you're an Ohio boy. Yes, I am from somebody Ohio. Told, somebody yeah. said, somebody we know mutually said, of all the people who have really have no business being in the Arizona, Arizona sun, you're probably the, the main one that shouldn't be there <laughs> yeah, redhead, fair skin. Uh, I've, I've had a couple run-ins with a little bit of skin cancer too, oh, no. so it's it it can be tough. You just got to keep protected who sunscreen and clothes. Who said that? One of our mutual friends said that. I said I was going to interview yeah. you. Yeah, but uh, so Ohio. Yes, lived in um, Ohio. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go. Lived in Ohio and then moved to. Arizona, but uh, grew up in Ohio my whole time. And you went to New Lexington High School. Yes, I did. Small town in southeastern Ohio, probably about 5,000 people at the time. I don't know how much bigger it is, but about the same size now. Were, were your parents musical? Uh, my mom played piano. My dad tinkered a little bit with guitar, but mom was piano, and that was, she was the main musician in the family at the time. And then my sister picked up guitar later, too. So with, I actually they, started on guitar. Oh, wow. Now, was your mom playing classical or uh, just the uh, songbooks? Or? It wasn't classical, but she would do, you know, the satin doll and misty and things like that. And she was taking some lessons from actually the, the teacher that I eventually took from. So it was a, kind of a nice little thing. Yeah, I imagine. So you grew up having these tunes in your head all the time. Yeah, I did. I, I, you know, we had a local Lions Club put on a fundraiser every year, and we did a lot of um, music, sing along type stuff. They would do. They had a big course, and then uh, you know that's how I got exposed to banjo because they would have banjo acts uh, come on and play on stage, and then they would have you know barbershop quartets and singers and just kind of a variety show fundraisers they did every year. So, so that's how I got exposed to the banjo. When you first picked up guitar, what kind of music were you listening to and wanting to play? Well, that was it. I picked up guitar in grade school and, and it was one of these ones where it was, it was in a Catholic grade school and pretty much we played for church services and things of that nature. And you it learned, was- You learned Silent was, Night early on then. Yeah, and you know Mariah and all those types sure. of things. So it wasn't jazz, and it wasn't the the type of stuff you know I'm used to playing now and I like to listen to now. Oh no, but, I understand. Um, I was just curious. Yeah, no, it was it was an interesting start. I started on guitar probably about fourth grade, I think, and uh, played it for a while. And then you know, all of a sudden one day, Dad came and said, "Hey, do you are you interested in taking banjo lessons?" And I said. 
I sure why not you know so uh, did he dabble in banjo at all no he didn't he he tried a little bit with guitar a little later on but after i kind of got into it he, he picked it up a little later and tried to have some fun with it but um no he wasn't very he wasn't the musician in the family i'm just saying it's it's unusual for a parent <clears throat> who's not a banjo player to say would you want to play banjo <laughs> that's all i'm saying well it came from going to those shows i was telling you the yeah, sure, sure. club and then he he also went over and listened to uh, my instructor at the time my first instructor was fred Dobbin, and he was from zanesville and my my father had gone over and listened to them play at various places and so he had been exposed to it he thought well i might try to see if fred would take him on as a student and so that's how we got started about age 11 i think it was and when did that light go off for you that that was something that you were actually interested seriously in? You know, it took a little while um, because you'd see, you know, his top students were the ones that were playing in, in the show and on the stage that I would get to see. And of course, they've been playing for years. So when I'm getting there and playing the single string notes, just the real whispering on one string, it was kind of like, wow, this is a little... You know, I know I got to learn and how to go through the through the steps and, and get better. And but I started on it's it's really funny. We had this banjo that was basically a I think it was probably what you call it, a yard sale banjo. It was just cobbled together from parts and didn't have a resonator. It was open back. It was it was a tenor and it had a bow in the neck and a curve in the neck, <laughs> so that you know the the first string hung out in middle of air and I had to push it up and the action was horrible and I used to take it in and Fred would try to tune it and we'd start the lesson it was a half hour lesson right and about 10 minutes into it he'd finally get it tuned he says man that thing's got a sound all its own so I, I think we, I played that for a while because my parents wanted to make sure that I would be sure. interested and stick with it before they invested some money into uh, a better quality banjo. And I, I don't know how long it was. I think it was about six to nine months. And Fred finally went to him and said, hey, um, I think it's time to buy him a, a, a real banjo. And so that was that was kind of the turning point there, I think. What, what was your first real banjo? What was the? Well, the first one I got in 1974 was just like the rest of the, the boys out there, a, a Vega Vox one. Oh, you um, started right out on the Vox. Yeah, and, and I like it. It's I still have it. It's uh, it's not my primary banjo now, but I played that for several years. And um, so Vega Vox won. And I remember it was one of those things where you had like a little uh, a sales slip was just writing the price of the banjo in the music book in pencil, you know. Yeah. It wasn't, a, you know, no, in, no big invoice and no, you know, bill of lading and all that. It was just, there, here's the sales price. We bought it and it's uh, still in my closet and I use it, pull it out every once in a while. I would imagine it's appreciated a bit. You know, I, I don't know what the market is for those. It's, uh, it, it varies. I think, you know, it depends on what the guys are looking for. I, picked up another couple banjos since then and they're probably worth a little bit more now, now that was the plectrum yeah plectrum that's when okay. i kind of switched from tenor to plectrum he said let's let's switch you over now and and so i have some regrets i think my biggest regret is that i didn't keep playing guitar i kind of dropped guitar and went to to the plectrum and um in hindsight i wish i would have kind of stuck stuck taking both in the yeah. end maybe not tenor and plectrum but i think the plectrum and the guitar would have been a good combination i always the guys who play multiple stringed instruments um always have fascinated me the guys who can play mandolin and, and plectrum and tenor and five string and and guitar uh because from a out an outsider's perspective it's a neck and strings and remembering the alternate tunings and where the chords are would me would mm -hmm. seem really hard but they're, I mean, you know, the guys who do it, they, they switch between all kinds of tunings and. Yeah, they do. And, and I, that was the type of person I took lessons from after Fred, Fred, my teacher, Fred Dodd, he left and after, shortly after I started lessons with him, he took uh, the job over to go down and play full time on the Delta Queen steamboat going up and down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. And he said, you know, I want to make sure you're in good hands. So he, um, basically said, asked his, uh, the studio owner, Chuck Spires at the time in Zaneville, if he'd take me on as a student. 
And so he took on Fred's top three or four students. And Chuck was one of those guys that could do exactly what you said. He didn't play plectrum. He played guitar. He played piano. He played steel guitar. He played all those things. He said, okay, plectrum. Oh, uh, what's the tuning? Okay. C, G, B, D. Okay. He said, okay. So that, and then he, he just start playing chords up and down the neck. And I was like, <laughs> how does he do that? And he, and he said, wait, uh, how do I play? Okay. This would be a flat, flat a G minor, you know, and, yeah, and then yeah. you do a flat G flat minor seven. And it's just like, all these chords he starts playing and he had never played one before. He just picked it up like it was crazy. But he was one of those guys that just had it, knew the music theory, could think his way around any musician, any instrument with strings. I would imagine, well, once you play steel, because that changes tunings constantly when you're playing in steel. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. uh, so, uh, that's, all this is always fascinating. Being a, being a tuba trumpet player, you know, three valves or three valves, ta-da. It's, it's mm -hmm. not like mm -hmm. switching, switching complete axes all the time. But, you know, what, what can I say? That's why I don't play banjo. And you think with all the exposure I've had to it, I would pick it up at some point in time. You have had plenty of exposure to it. No, I and, I, and I, I put it down immediately every time or have it taken away from me. But that's a different story. Funny. So since you started with a Vox and you started on Plectrum, does that mean you walked down that Eddie Peabody path originally? No, I didn't. I, I, I was kind of um, learning my own... Uh, learning my own from practicing my like I would sit and my dad had all these old Banjo King records uh -huh. and we picked up one when I in like 1974 we got one that was autographed by Scotty Plummer so I've got his original one Banjo on the Roof that wow. I would take down and I would just put on the record player and I would he was sit there every night player, and yeah. play oh he was and he was only like 12 years old when he recorded that one so that was kind of my exposure to it. I didn't know much about Eddie Peabody and the style uh, until I started listening to Brad play, Brad Raw. <laughs> but no, I wasn't really a, a Eddie Peabody person, never got exposed to it. So it was more of the Scotty Plummer and then my teacher, Fred, of course, his recordings. And then he was a big fan of Don Van Paltha. I don't know if oh, you sure. knew Don and he, so I had one of his records as well. Um, so yeah, it was, it was very, very different it wasn't straight into eddie peabody didn't know much about it. no i find it fascinating uh those particular two tunings and and the guys who play jazz on them because i because i understand way too much about banjo uh that i understand uh, what the tunings were built for i mean you know the plectrum tuning was built for chord melodies and i understand that and tenor is just kind of a viola tuning so it's really more single line it's not so much built for chords uh, necessarily. Right. And so it's always fascinating when people play plectrum with bands because uh, mm -hmm. it's not really what the instrument was built for. It was, it was kind of built as a solo instrument. So anyway. Yeah, and that was that was one of the things that I had to learn in, in when I started playing with different groups is you don't always play the melody. You got to learn to play chords and back people up and play rhythm. And, and that was a big part of playing in any of the groups that I played with. So that was something you didn't want to be back there playing a bunch of chords showing off all the time. It was, it was something you really had to, to learn. It was something you went through. Now, how, how old were you before you started playing with people other than other banjo players? Most banjo players start out in like banjo groups uh, uh, quite often. I, I didn't have a lot of banjo groups with in, in my area. There wasn't anything like that I was exposed to. So a lot of my early experience when I was a kid was playing, there was a little, uh, a little bar over in a town you know not too far from us called Lancaster and Lancaster had uh, a little place called Old Bill Bailey's and the owner Ben Smith was a piano player and so we would go over there and you'd start like on a Saturday night or Friday or Saturday night he'd show up at about 10 o'clock sometimes 10 15 at night and we'd sit there and play and he, he played the piano and he's one of these guys who just played honky tonk he stuck his right leg out he had a place where he just kicked the piano as he's playing <laughs> with his right foot on the ground and we'd play and we'd play with uh banjos we'd play um fred would have some friends would come in play one guy played saxophone another person would come in they'd play upright string bass but it's the wash tub you know the sure. wash tub with the yeah. boom bass they call it yeah yeah the boom bass we'd do that all night and play till you know, one o'clock was closing time and then drive home. And those were the days when they allowed smoking. So I remember I'd always 
in the garage and always start stripping off my clothes because I couldn't stand the, sh the smell of the smoke and I'd have to go in and shower. I remember before those I days. go to bed. We, we, in fact, you don't even realize it until you get out of the club, you know, or get into your car and all of a sudden you go, holy. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't, and everything smells, even your case. You open your case the next day. I had a little rag in there I'd wipe the neck with, and it was like just reeked of smoke. <laughs> it was, so those so were you learned a lot, of the, a lot of the barrel house standards, I would imagine, of that gave things like, you know, uh, Rose of Washington Square or just. Yep. yep. Nobody's sweetheart now. We do all that type of stuff. If you knew Susie, those types of things we would do. Yeah, so that was a lot of fun. And that was, that was probably my biggest exposure of playing. Now, out how old were you then? I was. 12 13 i know my parents would take me over when i got my driver's license at 16 they really got excited because they didn't have to drive me everywhere <laughs> so, yeah. so was that after hours i mean how did you guys get that away was, with having a young kid in the bar at those hours you know it was a, it was in small towns in ohio it was probably it would be frowned on today <laughs> I don't know. It, it was one of the things that was just not, no one ever really questioned it. Oh, it I'm sure it made you feel more like an adult too, hanging out with a, oh yeah, with, with a the old guys. And a lot of fun. Yeah. You learned some colorful and, language too. Oh, no, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> they, were, they were pretty good. Not as bad as today's language you hear sometimes, but yeah. then I played, um, I had another little gig I got into when, uh, after Fred left and I was taken from Chuck, I got called by, you know, the uh, Chamber of Commerce of Zanesville, which is where I would take lessons. So it was about a 20 mile drive from our hometown to Zanesville where I took lessons. And then not too far from there, they had this little uh, landing where they had a paddle wheel, little paddle wheel or, that would go up and down the King River and they would do um, cruises on it. It's called the you Lorena. You a banjo player. The Lorena Steamboat. And so they asked me if I'd play music for the summer. And I was like, 15 I think when I started playing there and um and my that was where my parents had to drive me over and drop me off and it was a I think it was a three three and a half hour round trip you'd go down the river and they'd serve dinner and then you'd cruise back up the river and they'd dock and everything so it was about three and a half hours a night so my parents had to kill some time we had to we were probably gone five hours I played solo sometimes I'd, I'd play with to a player that I, I could uh, bring on with me and we get a little more money and then I'd play for like I think I got 60 bucks for the three 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 and a half hours but sometimes I could make you know 60 to 100 dollars sure. in tips so it was pretty good money for 15 year old in high school and and it, it made you it gave you the opportunity to afford your first straw hat and vest I, I imagine absolutely red vest <laughs> had one that was reversible red on the inside or and black it was flippable i wish i still had some of those types of things i understand yeah no so it was it was a good experience a lot of solo work a lot of playing for people doing sing-alongs with them now, did you, know, you have a stage or were you like there wasn't really a stage i would set up kind of on the upper deck up near where the the cabin was for the the pilot or the boat the captain and then we had a little sound system would sit up there and broadcast out to the people that were sitting on the top deck with the dinner tables and all that so they always had it catered it was catered by a local restaurant that came in and so i got a free food i got paid to go play music and it was good so i did that gosh clear up until i graduated high school i think i did like five years something like that four years with it did you uh, did you have experience. to deal with any people who maybe uh, abided a little bit too much there or oh occasionally but you know i'm they, saying for a young they, kid playing solo banjo on a on a riverboat that where there's sort of the alcohol uh, you you would have to grow up pretty fast in that environment i would think you know i'm trying to remember on the alcohol whether they did or not um that's a good thing i, I don't recall a lot of people that way it was it was fun and it was i don't know that they even did have you were making some money yeah yeah, it was fun. And I'd get called to do private parties on it and things like that. So it was good experience. And, and uh, I, I look back on it. It was, a, it was kind of a really fun time and a good experience for someone my age getting to make money playing, playing music. So, so uh, you graduated in 81, right? Your class of 81? Yep. Yep. 81 in high and, school. And ended up going to Ohio State. Yeah. 
went to Ohio State. Now, what was your major? We were going to college. Mechanical engineering. Yeah, my dad was a mechanical engineer, and they had an engineering firm in New Lexington, Ohio. And I think everybody thought I was going to end up going to work there, and it just didn't work out that way. I it only makes sense for a banjo why. player. <laughs> yeah, you know, at Ohio State, I did a little bit of playing. I had, um, you know, I had some times I would like just want to get out of the study mode, and I'd drive down to. Um, German Village was a place down, you know, south of central Columbus. And they had a lot of restaurants down there. And one place had Schmitz, a German restaurant. I'd sit in with the polka band there. So I played some polka music. And then right across the street from them was a little place called Diebel's. And they served wonderful German food. And they had this uh, accordion player, I'll never forget, Esther Kral, C-R-E-W. And she was about four foot five and played uh, accordion. And then she had a bass player, string bass player, played with her Glenn. And I'd go in anytime I wanted, they'd say, come on down. And I'd sit in with them and we'd play music three, four hours. I'd get free food. It was, you know, free food and drinks. It was when good. you're in college, so, what more can you ask for? You know? Yeah, you know, and then occasionally I'd jump in the car and drive down to Lancaster to still go play at Old Bill Bailey's again. So I, I had some time I've got to play in college, but most of it was studying and trying to get my degree and keep playing, uh, keep playing music for fun and work on a profession, you know. While you were there um, and you were studying mechanical engineering, did you have a concept were you just thinking about that in terms of working for your father or did you have some other interest in that field? I think I always knew that I had the ability to go back and work for my dad and his brothers. Um, so I, I wasn't always concerned. Like if I got out of work, if I got out of college and the job market was horrible, I'm sure I could have gone there and worked. Um, and I never really thought about it. And then as I got closer to graduating, um, it just started, I just started looking. I said, well, I'll interview here and there and see what happens. And one day I had a friend and she, she had graduated a couple, I think a couple quarters ahead of me. And I was just walking across campus and I, I looked up and I, I saw her. I said, what are you doing here? And she says, oh, I'm working, I'm working in Arizona. I said, well, where are you working? And she said, oh, a place called Garrett Turbine Engine Company. And I said, well, wow, okay, so tell me about it. And she said, well, they're, they're interviewing here. And I said, well, I have to look into that. And it was really one of those things that I wasn't thinking about. You know, I kind of thought I would end up working in New Lexington, Ohio, and going back to live there. But it didn't work out that way. I ended up in Arizona working for Garrett. So you didn't have any girlfriend in Ohio uh, tying you down at the time? Not at the time. No, not at the time. So I had, uh, I had, um, what was I, interviewed in like end of, I graduated in December of 85. I took one extra quarter because I did some um, work study quarters, you know, working for IBM and, you know, just took a little extra time, one quarter to graduate. And I came out to Arizona in December. And when I, when I left, like on December 19th, it was 78 degrees. <laughs> and when I got back to Columbus with the wind chill, I think it was minus 22 or something like that. So it made the decision really easy. It's funny, since you've watched some of these interviews, you know that, that that's really common uh, with people who end up moving to Arizona or California, that one day they wake up and they're tired of scraping the snow off their car. And yeah. they just said, I'm yeah. out of here, you know? They are, for sure. It's, it's, uh, and so you went from 72 degrees back to the... Minus 20. It was like a 100 degree temperature change in four hours, I think. I was just like, oh, this is nuts. So do you ever regret that? You ever think, you know, maybe that cold wasn't so bad after all. <laughs> yeah, sometimes in these summers where we have like 110 degrees, 20 days in a row, you get a little tired of it. But, you know, as you know, Bonnie Otto, just moved, Bonnie Otto just moved into your area. Yeah, I do. I, was, I, I interviewed her uh, uh, uh -huh. a few days ago and, and she... She was astounded that at the 117, 116 degree temperatures. And I said, what were you expecting? And not exactly yeah. that's, that Sacramento's that much cooler, but you don't have the humidity. Yeah, I watch, I watch her Facebook feed. She's got a lot of posts. She just moved into her new home. And uh, I remember when she first moved here and she was, yeah, I said, you're in for some warm weathers. Don't, don't be prepared. So yeah, the summers here can be a little tough, but you know, the winters are 
untouchable. Yeah, yeah the, my, my old boss, uh, in fact, his interview just dropped yesterday or two days ago, George Andrus. He, he's in Arizona now. Mike mm -hmm. Vax is in Arizona now. And Bonnie, right. so Bonnie's there now. And so it's, it's kind of a, all my favorite players are moving to Arizona. I, I don't know what I'm... Yeah, I, I didn't know Bonnie as well, um, but I had seen Bonnie when I was playing a couple Dixie festivals like in the early 90s when she was playing. I think maybe it was, she wasn't with them, but um, I know that like uh, Bob Williams and yeah. Brady McKay were yeah. with Stan Marks River City Stompers. Well, I, I met her I when she was, she was there. Yeah, when those three guys got together, it was the form wooden nickel. Yeah, yeah. And that's when I met Bonnie and Bob and all those guys. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yep. No, I remember Bonnie from her wooden nickel days. That's where I really met her. Yeah, me as well. Yeah, those are the days. Uh, I think about them often. In fact, people are surprised that, like you, for example, people are surprised I still remember them. But that was, you know, like at the, at, almost at the apex of my career before I started traveling with Ed. Yeah. Yeah. So Arizona, uh, you got there when? Which year did you hit? I Arizona? moved in January of 1986. Yeah. Yeah. And how did Ed end up with you? Well, you know, there's a little bit of time between there, but I, um, well, yeah. from 86 to 94, I, I started just bumping around in Arizona when I got here. I didn't know anyone. Um, I made some friends and we'd start playing music at people's houses. And then I started just going in and sitting uh, in with musicians at jazz clubs or piano bars or whatever, just to meet people. And um, I started getting picked up to hire, you know, tuba banjo things and maybe get asked to play in a trio and then I kind of stumbled on to Dick Knutson's Desert City Six. They were the, the Dixieland band of the, in the valley at that time and so I'd listen to them a lot and um, eventually I ended up getting asked to take over uh, the banjo seat on uh, Desert City Six and that was like in the early 90s, 19, I think mean, it was 92, something like that so it was uh it was a good experience we had a steady gig we played um, every sunday night for four hours at the sunburst resort we had a really good crowd we would play and i mean and i did that for from 92 through end of 94 so I did two full years of that where we were playing and of course dick had a good booking agent and we got hired to go play for phoenix suns to play for the Arizona Diamondbacks, to play for the Arizona Cardinals games. We get a lot of gigs where it be trios or quartets and to go play. And it was a lot of it was a lot of fun, a good exposure for me. So who's um, the tuba player you ended up by doing most of your work with in Arizona? In Arizona? Well, there was a lot of different people. Um, right now I'm working mostly with Chuck Stewart. I don't know if you know Chuck mm -hmm. or not. He had a group, I think he was um, He's basically from the East Coast, played a lot with your father's mustache. And, um, but right now he has a little group in Arizona called the uh, Cracker Jack Jazz Band. I play with them on occasion. But usually I'll, I'll do that. And when we were at Desert City Six, um, Rick Felix was one of the a good musician in the area. He's since passed away, but he was a really good tuba player, played with quite a bit. Um, one of the ones that a lot of the banjo players out there that may hopefully watch this or may watch it, um, may know a guy named uh, Lynn Shoemaker. So oh, Lynn, sure. Lynn Shoemaker was one of the first people I met out here and Lynn and Louise would invite me over to their house. And I've got a picture of, of Lynn playing. and I playing, I've got a picture of Lynn and I playing together actually. Really, yeah. So I, I would get invited over and that's how I met, I think he introduced me to John Huntsberger, one of the banjo players. Yep. Um, he would take me like one time I went to one of the Feige conventions, the Fretted Instrument Guild of America now called All Frets. Um, he took me under his wing when I went to one of those, I think it was in Dayton in the eighties and took me around and introduced me to some of the people. So that was, that was a good experience. And so Lynn was really big in my early days here in Arizona. Good yeah, I, I sat next to Lynn at a Feige convention. I was with Banjo Mania, of course, and we were in Pittsburgh for the, one of the conventions. Mm -hmm. And I forgot what it was, but he and I ended up, it was probably a masked banjo band or something. I don't remember, but I've got a picture of him and I both in tuxedos sitting next to each other. Oh, that's great. He was a nice guy. Speaking of tuba guy. players, 
you 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 uh, have also done some time with one of my favorite and funniest friends, which is Red Lair. Yeah, yeah, we did actually. Uh, Red Lair is, and I, I I've been seeing them every year that they've been getting invited to come back out uh, the St. Louis Riverman to our jazz festival here in Arizona. So Red's a super nice guy. Met him on a, a cruise we did with Tenth Avenue, actually. Yeah. Yeah, he and Gene Cottrell, and I, I think John Becker was still with them, and the three of them came with, with us and Ed Zimbrick's group. We yeah. took a bunch of people on a cruise and trip, land trip. It was a lot of fun. I met Red um, when we were playing. I was playing with Miss Behaven up in Three Rivers, and uh, he came on right after, after we did on that venue that hangs out over the river. I don't remember what the venue was called, but uh, we, we played our set. And I came off the stage and I had never met him. And he grabs me by the arm and he pulls me over. He goes, how am I supposed to bull myself as the world's greatest sousaphone player if you're going to play like that? And, and I just- Rez is always that way. He's very- I know, he's great. Super guy, nicest guy you ever want to meet. And, and my other memory, I've got to tell you this because you'll appreciate it, it, was at the Firehouse lot in Sacramento. Once again, uh, we followed him this time. And I walked up to the cassette desk uh, and his wife was selling tapes. And so I'm just saying they're talking to her and looking at the tapes and he walks up to me, he goes, Dan, what are you doing? I said, leave me alone. I'm trying to hit on this chick. <laughs> and he just cracked up. Anyway, that, those are my two best memories of Red. If, when you see him again, please tell him that I still think of him. You know? I will. I, I, hope, I hope I get to see him this year. I you know it's one of these things. You don't know if this, this uh, jazz festival is going to happen in November. I hope it does. We're scheduled to play. So everything going if it goes well we'll see him in november i'm sure he uh i'm sure he's told you some of his classic jokes that we can't repeat oh yeah i've heard <laughs> plenty of them yep great stuff he had uh, me uh he had me sit in one year when they were playing the festival in arizona here i guess his uh his banjo player didn't wasn't up to traveling so remember he and he called me and asked me if i'd play with him for the weekend and i thought that was the most fun i ever had I, came in and Steve Lilly was on the trumpet and we just had a blast and I think Jim Mayhack and trombone and all those guys so there was a lot of good experiences playing with that group for the weekend actually Jim Jay just gave me an interview too um I met him on the frogs originally and then yeah. he, he actually played my band the first federal jazz band we did a year of that band and, and he was on that a great guy I, I love him to death actually he's one yeah. of the guys yeah. Well, when I was with Desert City Six, I, I was working with the jazz club and I would help bring in bands to play for the, you know, in the, we, or the weekly or the monthly meetings, sorry. And I would book, help book them. And I remember booking uh, Wood Nickel would bring them down for the day and they played for the, it was like that particular one was a mini festival. So we put them up at the Sunburst Resort in one of these big back rooms and we all went back after the gig and we sat and we made spaghetti in the place and ate and hung out with the musicians so it was, those were good times and i think i even remember i might have brought your group i don't remember if i did uh, well, you brought, i think i think you may have brought either miss i think it was miss behaven you brought down yeah and then i remember bringing in one time um bill dindle's group oh south market street south market street yeah brought them in so it was always good to get exposure to that's how i got exposure to the different bands when i was playing there uh but the one the one i gotta tell you this story this is this was one when i was playing with desert city six and it was in 1992 and we were um playing over in palm springs and i just gotten into town and i was met my aunt and uncle who were there on vacation and we're sitting in the the house and there was this earthquake hit and we started shaking things were crazy. And long story short, went through to play with the, the band that weekend at the local hotel. It was the jazz festival. And that's where I first time I saw, I seen um, Bob Williams, Brady McKay playing with Stan Marks, Ruby City Stompers. I was playing with Desert City Six. And one night I'm sitting there and I'm walking through the, the lobby of the hotel past the lounge and everybody was gathering in there. And uh, I thought, well, I got to poke my head in here and see what that is. And it turned out to be you and Brad Roth doing a, a banjo tuba uh, little session. The Brad and Dan wow. show, as I used to call it. 
Oh, it was it was phenomenal. I sat there and grabbed a grabbed a recorder from my uh, from Dick Knutson and sat there with a the tape right in the front and listened for two nights. You did it both nights. The first night, my recording didn't turn out because I had its settings wrong or something. It just it was all distorted. But second night, I came in and got a really good recording of you two playing. And I think Bill Dendel popped in at that particular session too and just sit and listen to Brad. And, and Bill play yeah. and you playing tuba with them. That was that was very memorable. I still still remember those those special moments. So that was how I might really the first time I think I'd really had a lot of exposure to hearing Brad play. So Oh yeah. Well it's life changing to hear him. Um, you know, he just uh, he and I were pretty inseparable for probably about six years or even more. because uh, not only were we doing the duo and we were doing banjo mania, but we did not very farm together. We did misbehaving together for the longest time. You know, uh, I was his tuba player and, uh, and it sort of came to the end at, at the end of my run with banjo mania, but it's great. It was great to interview him and, and get uh, reconciled and, and, ha and have a good time, you know? Yeah, it's good. It was good to see. You. I like that interview. It was I think good. about three years ago, I sent him a, a random email and said, you know what? We ought to go do the Brad and Dan show again. And his reply was, oh, those were good times. And then I never heard from him again. <laughs> but, you know. Yeah. No, so after my, my stint, I was, um, when I was in Desert City Six, I uh, started out, the drummer was Gene Bruegel. And sure. Gene, Gene left. And, you know, he, he and Dick always had a little, uh, you know, riffs every once in a while. And Gene left on his own and was playing. And, he came up to me one day and said, hey, um, I'm playing with a group in San Jose. And he said, I want you to talk to the leader. And I said, okay. So it was like December of 94. I get this phone call from uh, Ed Zimbrick. And he said, hey, you know, are you interested in joining the band? And I'm, he was kind of bringing back, call it the new 10th Avenue Jazz Band at right. the time. Right? Because the, the band was yeah. formed. Yeah, the band was formed like in what, 1959, like four years before I was even born. <laughs> yeah, when he was up in Oregon. The yeah. First, and that, it, was, it was the street that the band rehearsed on. The yeah. 10th yeah. And so I said, sure. So he says, okay, I'm going to send you an airline ticket. You fly over to San Jose next week. And I said, what? You know, he, so he, he would fly us into practice. And he flew uh, me from Phoenix and Gene from Phoenix and Jerry Herman's from Portland and Dan from Washington, Dan yep. Marcus, um, Phil Kirk. And by then, the way, it hasn't dropped yet, but I, I've got an interview with Dan also. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, and, and uh, Jim Buckman from Florida. Right. Like, wow. And we put, he put us up in a hotel and we practiced in his, he practiced in a lounge or a hotel ballroom. He rent out and finally went and started practicing in his garage at his home in Morgan Hill. So that was, those were good times. I mean, it, it was, it was a big change for me because I really didn't, I'm not great at reading music. That's why when I. Well, I remember someone, when I joined the, you were still with the band when I got in, of course. Yeah. And, yeah. and it really stretched all of us as far yeah. as, you know, I mean, we were doing everything from live and let die to uh, smoky mokes and everything oh. and everything in between. Well, he, he threw in some classical stuff and then he'd go to rock and roll and then he'd throw some country in. And then we'd turn around and play squirrel nut zippers, you know, put a lid on it or something. I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I found out eventually, well, I, I should have found out earlier. I'm just a little dense, but you had to watch what you said around him because he would arrange for example, when we uh, ended up with uh, our new guitar player, Al Weaves, um, uh, I think he was the last guy who was there when I was there. And uh, he was mentioning that he was in psychedelic bands in the 60s. Of course, the next day, Ed brings like five or six arrangements. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's crazy. I, I don't know where he got the arrangements. They're just in his head, you know, and he would put these things down on paper. And I mean, I've, I've watched him write stuff out and I was amazed how fast he could write all the parts and he could write and transpose to all the different horns and everything. I was like, wow, this, this is something. So it was a stretch for me. I didn't read music well. I learned to read. I, I fumbled through some of the tunes. I remember, him, was, I remember him teaching you potato. Yeah, yeah. Which there is the rhythm for the Latin tunes that we were doing. Yeah. You know? 
he did a lot of stuff that I mean I had never heard before and so it was a, it was a very good experience for me I had to force myself to read but honestly Dan I got to play with so many good musicians I mean there's a lot of musicians rotated in oh, God. You know, he couldn't have everybody the same the same crew all the time so sometimes people would rotate in but you know the, well the, yeah I was with the hot frogs when yeah. when he found me um and uh, and for a while there as you know people used to joke that all we did was change shirts between sets uh, right. everybody everybody right. but Les Deutsch uh, right. Charlie right. Clark you know and everybody else was interchangeable but uh, well and that's where the the thing came in like Joe Ashworth came up and took over the clarinet after Jim you know had to just cut back on some of his travel and, and Joe played with him for years he was hot frogs and, oh I love playing with Buckman though he was oh incredible I, I, and I, the, the trombone players that went through there too of course Jim Mayhack and and mm -hmm. Jackson Stock and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Steve Tyler yep a, a yep. bunch of I remember guys. playing with Steve having him come down with the frogs I brought him to Phoenix once and he was a monster player love, love listening to he Steve. still is by the way yeah. oh I can imagine <laughs> I can imagine so I mean the 10th Avenue was probably the best part of it you know I, I was with him and we got to do some crazy things and we got to go play all these festivals all over and you mentioned Three Rivers I never got to play the festival there but I remember playing for their jazz club a few times right at the entrance to the park and everything what a wonderful place to go play music and, and the a couple cruises so here and there yeah and uh, the big one was in 1996 we got to go do the edinburgh international jazz festival so that was one of the highlights of my time with them so remember that week it was it was uh yeah. very it was very wonderful. cool i remember yeah. running into howard alden there at, uh, in edinburgh in, in edinburgh of course he, he was just he just was uh, incensed that i was actually there um, but it was kind of funny. Yeah, we ran into each other. He had a solo set. He was there as a guest artist, obviously. Huh. And no, he had, it was right when he was going through his chemo. And, uh, oh. and uh, but I walked in, he goes, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm here with Tim Avenue. He goes, oh, well, it's good to see you, Dan. You know, but he wasn't, that's the last person he expected to see in Scotland. No, and, and so those were great. We did some cruises and did some land trips and met a lot of great people and miss those days. Those were those were some fun times. There was one there was one of the Mexico cruises we did, and I'm pretty sure you were on it when it got really violent on the water. Oh yeah. And yeah. we were all sliding across the room in our chairs. Literally the whole band would slide to one side of the ship and we'd slide to the other. I can remember one of those the Ensenada and I think we went out to the um Catalina Island, I think we went out and stopped at one of those places. Yeah. That was the cruise, I think. Yeah, it got some rough seas those nights. Yeah, that's where I really got to be friends with Big Tiny, was on one of Ed's cruises. Hmm. But, uh, well, the trip over to Edinburgh was nice because we followed it up by going into the UK and we did the Brecon Jazz Festival. And that's where I got to meet Mark uh, Rogers in, in Manchester Jazz Band that he had. And good friendship for many years with Mark. He was yeah, we stayed in touch until guy. his passing too. Yeah. He was a class guy. I talked to him by email too. He was a nice guy. One of the best guys I ever met. So that was fun. Those were good times. I think my my second first first year with Tenth Avenue, I traveled, whether it was to practice in San Jose or go play a festival or whatever. I traveled forty three out of fifty two weekends. Yes. So I'm yeah. running to the airport every Friday afternoon or whatever to try to jump on a flight to San Jose and right if we know. weren't at a festival or overseas he would take bring us up to the house to rehearse and yeah we stay at the Wyndham there on Main Street yeah yeah some of the time the Wyndham and Our time away from home yeah it was and so those were tough and then as, as he started getting going with the band it was um more and more time and it was when he started to get a lot of those international trips and so it was the year i think it was 98 something like that he was going to plan to go to russia and then the um, trip to uh, yeah, australia I left, I left right before russia yeah and and i was i was um wanting to go on one of them but i couldn't i didn't have a vacation because that's my day job right i have limited vacation and i'm looking okay I want to do the three week trip to Australia. And that was the one I held out. I skipped the Russian trip. And then after the Russian trip, he came and said, you know, Matt, I really need someone that can make more of the gigs and 
you know, that's kind of where I part, we parted ways. Unfortunately, I would have really loved to have done one of those trips because I do, I, I actually see you have one of the, one of the pictures in your lead in for these interviews is a yeah. shot of the van. And I don't know, I don't know who was, is it, was it Pat Deneen? Yeah, Pat Deneen took your that? place. Right after. So Pat was in that picture. I couldn't tell. It went by really fast, but I thought it was Pat. And so those are ones that I, I kind of regret missing out on, but it was fun. I mean, I had a lot of good times with uh, 10th Avenue, got to record a few CDs. And um, so that was, that was interesting because I'd never done that before either. So being in separate rooms and, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, we talked about it a little bit at, at some point in time where what got me, what ended up making me leave was just Charlie. And if you're listening to this, Charlie Clark, it's just the truth. He used to call us, to, uh, say we want to meet in the lobby at, at uh, 9 a.m. And then he wouldn't show up till 11. We'd all be down there. We'd all be down there at the hotel. Or, or we'd, he would be leading the caravan into these cities, you know, across, across the world. Uh -huh. and, he, and he wouldn't bother to look it up. He would, he would go to a town center somewhere, get out and ask a guy in a Seven Eleven where the venue oh was. My, oh my gosh! And that happened yeah. a lot when we were in England and things. And I just, I'm so, uh, I'm so ADD and and, uh, you know, I just couldn't handle that kind of in, insecurity for me. So finally, Ed had me drive the equipment truck, and, and Pat and I had a truck to ourselves. Oh. So I would leave, and I would get to the venue like two hours before the rest of the band. And just set up and hang out, and you know Charlie would wind his way through fourteen cities before he found the right way. That's funny. That's funny. No, Charlie's a, Charlie is one of the best piano players I ever played with. Though oh, he's he's great. He's, he's phenomenal, and he shouldn't um, be managing a band. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, I, the good part, Charlie. Charlie came over to Arizona for or my wedding with my wife Dee, and. He uh, came and came to the wedding at the Phoenician Resort in uh, 1997 when we got married, and he played with me. We played in the Mary Lanes after the after the reception or during the reception. So it was great, good experience. I always have fond memories of Charlie, even if he uh, if I don't get to see him much anymore. I'm I'm not even sure where he is. But. Neither I am. I'm not either. I've because uh, I'm still you know the 10th Avenue is still going with Louis Kaiser leading the band. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Uh, and it's more of a swing band now, but uh, I, I was looking it up when I was researching all of this. And, yeah, uh, Lewis, Lewis played some with the band when I was with him. He'd sit in sometimes if Phil couldn't make it. Lewis. I think he did all the recordings, actually, if I remember right. No, no. Um, all the recordings I have, Phil Kirk did the three. I don't know how many of you guys did after I left the band, but the three I was on was Phil. Okay. As a matter of fact, I was just looking through those it, the recordings and the dates and all that just to kind of refresh in my mind for this and the third recording was my, probably my favorite the one we did um that one he called the rampart train but actually less deutsch slide in and play tuba during that recording but your picture is in the insert for yeah. the cd because i think that's kind of you came it's into really the band kind of, about the time after that it's kind of amazing how close Les and i play like each other also um, oh i i'm amazed i i didn't even know that was a funny thing when I was listening to your interview with him I had no idea about the organ and you're hearing you guys talk about organ I mean the guy plays everything he plays he's, organ he's piano, an absolute bona fide genius tuba I, I just his tuba on on the recording we did we did uh I think that was the one I did Bye Bye Blues on and we did one take and it was just like phenomenal right and he and George Urson who's probably about the best drummer I think I've ever played with oh phenomenal and that yeah. whole band was just uh, ridiculously clean, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's just crazy. I, as you see, I posted a few things. I liked your comment that you enjoyed hearing the band again. Um, I did. I, I think it was probably close to, had to be close to 2000 is what you were saying, right about top the time frame. So yeah. yeah, I don't have that recording. I'd love to get, get a hold of some of oh, those. Uh, not... Maybe I can find a way to send, send you a copy. Yeah, those we'll are see. good. But no, now yeah, I'm, so it's cool. So, uh, now, what actually caused you, was you just too much time away from home that made you leave 10th Avenue or? Well, I was, I was wanting to play as much as I could and kind of split the seat with someone because I just couldn't get off as much time as Ed wanted. I mean, we were doing, he was doing like three, four international trips a year that were two, three weeks each. And I had four weeks of vacation. So. Yeah, you were right. Your count was right, by the way, about 43 to 45 flights a year. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I had tons of time on the airplanes and i gotta be honest i i 
I would have kept playing with the band, I think. Um, but I, he just wanted someone that could make more of the gigs. And I think that Pat, that was a perfect fit for Pat, you know, at the time I've never, um, I don't know. I never really aspired to make a living playing music. I was wanting to kind of do it for fun and have my, you know, engineering job as my main support. And I don't, you know, I don't miss it from that perspective of all the traveling. I mean, I haven't even had my banjo on a plane since 9-11. It's really, I've been playing locally mostly. And if I go back to Ohio to visit, I'll borrow someone's banjo to play while I'm back there or something. But um, yeah, I haven't traveled with a, a musician in a musician uh, perspective for a long time. Well, just coincidentally, I kind of stopped at 9-11 and it wasn't on purpose. That just mm -hmm. sort of when I, I left the band and I stopped traveling so much, mm -hmm. um, which I later found out was, I mean, you remember the stuff we used to pull as far as luggage was concerned. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. Cause we'd read complete sound systems and drum sets. And uh, with a, yeah, it was just crazy, the stuff we used to do and get away with. Yeah, no, it was. Um, and, and, you know, th those were hard. Those were hard times traveling, too, because sometimes you would sit there and you would you wouldn't know when you're going to have your last set right at a festival or after recording. So you'd always book a flight later and then you would get to the airport four hours before your flight. Say, wow, I'm going to try to go jump on that flight. And then you'd find out, well, they, you know, Southwest wants to charge you a full upgrade. And you say, well, wait a minute, that's like half the money I made this weekend and <laughs> get on an earlier flight. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time sitting in airport lounges. I know that. Yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, and I don't know if you realize the trouble that uh, Ed Pio and Pio Travel went through, or they actually, no. they actually got prosecuted for embezzlement and, and took that whole travel agency down, which was our travel oh, agency. Yeah, that was who took those big tours over to the Mediterranean cruise we did. And when, I did when I did China with 10th Avenue, we got, we got done with the tour and I, I got my ticket. And I was supposed to be flying back to San Francisco. And I have a, had a gig in LA that night. Oh, wow. <laughs> I got tough. on the phone with them. Oh, anyway, those were the days. Yeah, they were. So miss those days, but it, I look back on them a lot of time with a lot of fond memories. So you're, are you, you're still playing, of course. Yeah, I play um, with a bunch of little different groups here in town. Um, I've got a group that I just joined about a year ago, I think, a little over a year ago, called the Sun City Stompers. And we uh, had a steady gig every two weeks. We'd play at a place. And, you know, since last March, that's kind of been on hiatus. So, so you're still the kid in the band then? I am. I'm, I think I'm the youngest. That, that I've got the trumpet player by a few months, I think is what I'm told. But, I mean, our piano player still hanging in there. I think he's 91. And so we're 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 a we have quite a spread of musicians in that in that band but it's really fun we have a great crowd and a lot of good people listen to out in uh at peoria where we go out and play the music and then i'll sit in with it you know cheryl thurston has a group here i'll play with her every once in a while um uh, there was one time a few years ago someone uh, the drummer from dan reed's dixie hot shots he said hey you ought to come down there's this sit-in and I can't remember the name of the place, but you can come in and sit in and I play and there's a couple guys and I go down one night, I just picked it and I show up and we're sitting there and I never met him before, but Howard Alden was sitting there. He and Diane were sitting at the table. And so we got our banjos out. He had his tenor with him and had my plectrum. We had never played before. And we got up on to play with the guys that were the, the main musicians. And they just looked at us and goes, how long have you guys been playing together? So this is our first time. <laughs> so that was kind of fun. That was my first experience meeting Howard. And that was, and since then I've got to play with him a few times here in Arizona. But so yeah, I do a lot of things playing with our local jazz club with different groups and it keeps me busy. Yeah, I, I, when I check out the Howard interview, when I uh, interviewed him, I told him how grateful the four string community was that he never shunned banjo. That, you know, he, um, mm -hmm. I, I quoted, I think it was Downbeat Magazine or, or some prestigious jazz, ma jazz magazine that said the only question with Howard Alden is uh, not if he's the, not if he's one of the best uh, guitar players in the world, 
but if he's the best guitar player ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and uh, the fact that he always kept his banjo and kept playing and performing on it is, as you know, a lot of these guys who switch between banjo and guitar at some point in time decide they're not going to play banjo anymore. Mm -hmm. And he stuck by it. And uh, I, I really told him that I know the people that I play with really appreciate it, you know? Yeah, I, I think the versatility would be there. I'd love to have the guitar if I would have kept it up to where I could just pick it up. Like you hear, you know, Brad plays phenomenal guitar. Yeah, he's doing well. What he's doing with his girls and, and their group. And it's it's uh, something I wish I would have kept up and never dropped because I would have had the two musicians, the two instruments to go back uh, and forth between would be a really nice change. Yeah, D Doug's, doing, Doug's doing a cool thing, of course. He, he plays all the banjos and all the guitars and mm -hmm. and uh, another one of those versatile guys, although I can't seem to get him to want to do an interview. But that's beside the point. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, man, no, this has been so much fun, man. Go ahead. It has been. It's good to good to talk to you again, Dan. It's been a long time. 20, 20 years, I think. Yeah, it was only yesterday. And yeah. you haven't and you haven't aged at all, my friend. You know. Well, I, I'm feeling a little older, but I'm I don't, trying. To I don't see young. any gray on the sides at all. And uh, there's, yeah. there's plenty of things that can take care of that. <laughs> Make sure to say hi to D for me. I will. I'll definitely tell her you said hi. We all had some good times together. Yeah, we did. At one point in time. We and uh, and uh, let's try and get back on the stage together sometime. I'm available Definitely. to travel to Arizona at any time, you know. Okay, we'd love that. We'd love that. We had a good time and I feel very honored to be interviewed and uh, with the, the uh, clientele that you are interviewing, the people, the musicians, it's phenomenal people and I feel honored to be included in that group. Oh, yeah, yeah well, Thank you. There's no reason to feel honored necessarily, other than the fact that, uh, that I enjoyed my time with you and, and still think about you often, as well as all oh. these other people. Um, well, good. I, I've, just had a real, I've just had a really fortunate life, you know? Mm -hmm. I talk about the fact that I, my first banjo player I ever played with was Howard. And from him, I went to Brad. Tough life. Just <laughs> luck. Life. Just absolutely dumb luck, you know? Yeah, I think I think And then I, I went to you. Are... So... Uh, I can't complain. Pat Deneen isn't a slouch either. No, no. hell no. He's top player. It's uh, it was it's great to play with all those guys and get to listen to them now. I, I have all the I think I have most of the banjo mania recordings. I don't have them all. I don't think, but the ones I have, I pull out and pr practice with them a lot all the time. Well, Matt, you give everybody uh, uh, my love, and you should get together with these people that are down there now and form a band. I mean, how would how cool yeah. would that be? You know? Yeah, there's a lot of people. I have to find out all the names you were um, dropping earlier and get me some phone numbers. <laughs> there you go. All, all right. right, sir. You take care right, of yourself. Dan. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Anytime. All right. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you for watching Trad Jazz today. Dan shows new interviews every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Make sure to check out the archive of past shows and please give us a thumbs up when you subscribe to the channel. Bye.